he had always planned on like controlling his death in a certain way. And, but he had the stroke beforehand and it was just a miserable experience. He laid, um, nobody found him. Like I couldn't oh, get a hold no. of him. So I called the neighbor to go check on him and he'd been laying there for a few days. And I'm so excited to introduce you guys today to Jill McLennan. She's a certified death doula, and she's going to share about her remarkable journey and the vital work that she does to support individuals and their families facing the end of life. And let me just share with you why this is important to me really quick. So when my dad passed away, um, I learned that this is a topic that's not discussed a lot often. And since then, when I bring it up, I see and feel how people like to back away from it. So I wanted to bring it up so that we can prepare for something that we're all going to go through. Our, everybody we know that are going to go through, we're all going to die. So Jill's path to becoming a death doula really began when she started to care for her grandmother during the final stages of her life, which sparked a deep passion for ensuring others can also find healing and beauty in their end of life experiences. And through her compassion, knowledge, and specialized techniques, Jill offers a comforting presence and guidance to her clients, helping them navigate the challenges of this profound transition. So guys, everybody, welcome Jill McLennan. How are you? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today because this is kind of a really cool um, subject and almost like, I don't want to say a passion subject for me. But it's one of those, um, when my dad, um, he had a really bad stroke mm. and he had always planned on like controlling his death in a certain way. And, but he had the stroke beforehand and it was just a miserable experience. He laid, um, nobody found him. Like I couldn't oh, get a hold no. of him. So I called the neighbor to go check on him and he'd been laying there for a few days and, you know, and, um, so they took him to the hospital and um then we were he was feeling optimistic like okay maybe he was having kind of some fun had great doctors but then when he had to go into rehab he's like this is horrible i don't want to do this so he basically put himself into hospice and just i you know just chose to go through that hospice experience which was a horrible way to go it was mm -hmm. horrific. Like, I was like, we treat our pets better than this. Yeah, we do. And honestly. <laughs> yeah. And like, we tried to like, okay, I'm in Texas and some states they can assist you, but in Texas, they don't allow that. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, how can we get, but then we're like, no, because he has to have citizenship. Like we were just like, just stuck. Yeah. And having to, um, have the wherewithals to choose to go in such a horrible way, you know? Mm -hmm. like, Unfortunately, that's a story that I hear often that people, when I ask people if they're afraid of dying, most people aren't afraid of death itself. They're afraid of the process that leads up to it because we've all seen those experiences and it's not yeah. good. It's not so what what led you to this place? When I moved home to New Jersey, that was back in 2007, I guess, um, I moved in with my 90-year-old grandmother. And the last four years of her life, my husband and I lived with her. And she was healthy when we moved in, um, quickly got a cancer diagnosis. Within like a couple weeks of us moving in, she was like, there's this weird lump in my chest. Wasn't in her breast. It was like up above. It was like close to her shoulder. And it turns out that it was cancer. And so 90 years old, we, you know, I say we, but, you know, the doctors, her, my mom and I, we decided to do surgeries and radiation and all these things that now when I look back, I'm like, maybe we didn't have to put her through all of that. Yeah. Uh, because that was four years of not really a great experience. You know, she had a lot of pain and suffering that she maybe would not need to have had if I would have known then what I know now. 
But when we got down to her last about month of her life and she was on hospice at that point. Um, So, you know, we'd stopped all these different treatments. It was really more just about keeping her comfortable. Um, But it still was overwhelming to me because it didn't look like it did in TV shows. You know, it didn't look like it did in movies. It wasn't grandma just sleeps a lot and then dies peacefully. It was a whole different process of her not knowing who I was, especially in the middle of the night. She was up in the middle of the night thinking I was a nurse that was trying to kill her. It was so overwhelming. But then thankfully hospice when I kind of was like bugging the nurses constantly. I'm like, she was doing this and she was saying this, understand. And we're like, no, 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 it's fine. This is normal. This is natural. This is what happens to people at the end of life. Then I started to relax. I wasn't as stressed out and upset, which then in turn made her less stressed out and upset because she would say something weird to me. And, you know, rather than being like, you know, the one night she said, you don't hear those women that are singing. And I was like, no. And she's like, they're standing right behind you. And I'm like looking over my shoulder. I'm like, uh, no, there's nobody there, but tell me more about it. Rather than being like, there's nobody there. What are you talking about? I just kind of went with it. And then it just, she relaxed, I relaxed. And it was a beautiful experience for me to be able to be there with her at the end of her life. I still didn't want her to die. But the reality was that she was dying. I just didn't want her to suffer. And so I was able to help ease her suffering the more that I understood what was happening and the more that I was able to relax and just yeah. kind of go with the experience. And so after she died, I said to my husband, I might want to be a hospice nurse. And he was like, all right, honey, whatever you want to do. Um, but at that point we had a bakery, we had a six month old baby. It was not really the right time to go back to school to become a hospice nurse. Plus, some of the nursing stuff, I was like, mm, I don't know if I could do that. You know, nurses, I give them a lot of credit because there's definitely things that I'm like, I'm not sure I could do that. Part. So life moved on as it always does because, you know, we can't stop time. And we ended up having a second child. We closed our bakery. We moved. And I heard about death doulas in 2019. And I was like, oh, that's it. That's what I want to do. And so here I am. Almost here you are. Here. Yeah. So our goal is to, um, to help folks recognize that we're not wanting to extend the suffering, right? Because and it is so interesting because people so excitedly prepare for birth, mm-hmm. right? With um, so much fervor and energy. And the thing is, we all know that we're all going to die. What do you think keeps people from wanting to talk about death? Because it's happening. Like we're living to live or we're dying. Like there's. Yeah, we're all going to die, right? That is the reality. Every second we get one second closer to death. We don't know when, most of us, right? I mean, I like to think I'm gonna die when I'm 95, but I don't know, you know, I could die tomorrow. I don't know for sure. But all I do know is that every second is one second closer to death. And that's okay, right? That That is an all right why thing. People, why won't people talk about this? What What keeps people from, from having this conversation do you see? And how do you get people past that to where, they get into ease with that. Yeah, it's, I think, a combination of things. Um, A lot of it's cultural. We just, we grow up not talking about it. Our parents don't talk about it. Our friends don't talk about it. Strangely enough, though, we see it in the media in a really dramatic way, right? Think of like the deaths that you see in movies and TV shows where people are getting blown up and they're getting shot and killed. And it's like, we love that. (laughs) Exactly. It's quick. Or, and again, in the movies, you know, the, like, what was it? Like the notebook, you know, where it's like, oh, it's so romantic and like, oh, and they lay down and it's so sweet. And it's, we don't see the realities of it. We want the entertainment version. 
So that leads me to believe that there's still part of us that craves this conversation, that craves this information, that craves this, but we're not getting it in our real life. And so the dramatized version we gravitate towards. Because you think of people that'll say, oh, you know, I tried to talk to my, oftentimes it's like somebody that's a little bit older and they tried to talk to their children about what they want after, you know, after they die, what they want leading up to death. And they get the response of like, oh, you don't have to worry about that right now. You're not dying yet. Oh, let's not talk about that. We don't want to talk about that. So the conversation gets shut down when people try to have it. And so we're already a little bit uncomfortable. It takes a lot of bravery to start the conversation. Then people shut it down. And so then we just kind of get stuck in that loop that then when we do need to have the conversation, we can't because the person's had a stroke. Exactly. They had a stroke and they can't talk or whatever else it is. It's too late to have it when we need it. And so we need to have the conversation now, but we're just afraid of it. Because also, I mean, it is a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah, so you have a checklist, right? Yeah, I, I definitely have different things that I use um, with clients, but also that I just kind of use within my community of these are different ways that we could start the conversation. It doesn't have to be a big, heavy conversation. And if it gets a little bit emotional, that's okay too. Why are we afraid of emotions? Why are we afraid of feeling things? It's, you know, yes, when I talk to my husband okay. about him dying, of course, I don't want him to die. I mean, especially don't want him to die soon. Having the conversation is not going to make that happen. It's also not going to prevent anything from happening either having the conversation other than it will prevent me from being in a situation. We had two people recently in our community whose husbands died young, like our age. The kids are the same age as our kids. And one was away on business. I think one was home, but it's still like they woke up one day not thinking that the end of their day was going to look like it looked. And so I will be more prepared if that is me. I still hope it's not going to be. I'm still going to be upset. You know, I'm still going to grieve. I'm still going to go through the process, but I'll be more prepared for all of the things that you have to do when somebody you love dies, rather than being like, oh my gosh, I don't even know where to start. I don't know where our paperwork is. I don't know any of that. Right. So that's one of the benefits of having the conversation. So I love that you have the endoflifeclarity.com as your website. So it's endoflifeclarity.com slash about dash Jill is a place that that checklist is probably a really great place to start. Yes. And what I have found, and you might find this too, is having a conversation with a visual always helps. Like if you just have the conversation without a visual, then it's it does get emotional. But if you can just have a checklist, it helps take the emotion away. Um, that's probably in giving birth and anything that we have yeah. to do. Yeah, the more prepared we are for the conversation, the more prepared we are for the end of life, the easier it's going to be. So the checklist is helpful. I actually even have a Facebook group where almost every day, I just post a different question about life, about death, about grief, whatever else it is. And I've had so many people say to me, they might not even comment in the group, but they're people that like are in my local community that they'll come up to me and they'll say, I love the questions that you post. I will talk to my husband. I'll talk to my father. I'll talk to my children. I'll say, oh, the question in the group today was this. And then it starts this really beautiful conversation amongst me and my family. And that's really what we need to do is it's not like sit down and spend three hours talking about this. Right. I know. Oh, yeah. Every couple of days, every few months, you know, just like the nine months leading to having a baby. It's yeah. the same. It's that same concept. So that Facebook group, how, what's an, is it end of life clarity? Is it's end of life. Clarity? Yeah. It's end of life clarity circle with circle added yeah. on, but my website has links to like all my stuff. So that's always a good place Easy. to start. Yeah. Easy. So, okay. So at the end of life, you've had this conversation, you're um, somebody, what is it that you think is the biggest challenge for family members when somebody has, they, they've either like to make the decision to go into hospice. So there's that transition from, from 
okay, we're going to work towards living to, okay, we're going to work to stop the suffering so that we can pass. And how often is that decision made by the person who's, you know, going into hospice and how often is that made by the family and what are the challenges that you see there a lot? I think the biggest challenge is there's a lot of misconceptions about hospice. People think first off that hospice is only for the last couple of days leading up to death, which is not true. People can be on hospice. I think we were just talking the other day, Jimmy Carter's been on hospice for like 18 months, right? Like, so you could be on hospice long term. It just means that you're going to stop all of the quote unquote life saving treatments, you know, things like cancer treatments. You're not going to get CPR or intubation if something were to happen. Like you're going to allow your body to die naturally. And along with that is going to be keeping you comfortable. So they're not going to stop your blood pressure medication necessarily. Um, I have somebody that I was talking to the other day that if he stops his heart medication, it'll essentially fill him up with fluid, which means that he'll die an uncomfortable death. So he he'll still takes he'll he'll drown, drown, right? Yeah. He will drown. But he takes that medication, but he stopped other treatments that are going to try to like cure his cancers, right? So that's one of the biggest things is there's a lot of misconceptions about what going on to hospice means. Plus, I've talked to people that have straight up said, hospice killed my mom. And I'm like, mm, I don't think that's accurate. Um, they're not going to come in and give your mom morphine and kill her. What tends to happen is people wait too long to get on hospice. So by the time that they do, hospice comes in, they give mom morphine, they stop all of these treatments. Now suddenly mom's relaxed, she's comfortable, and her body's like, I'm done. And so they die fairly quickly. It's not that hospice came in and gave morphine to kill them. It's just that we we are waiting until the like really the end when we could have been using hospice a lot earlier. Right. So I think if we can clear up a lot of the misconceptions of hospice and what it means, because we still have that culture of fight. We have to fight. We have to fight. We have to fight. You know, mom's got cancer. We're gonna fight that cancer. Well, eventually, we're causing more harm than good to the yeah. body by fighting a cancer that is not going to get cured. Especially again, when you talk of like my grandmother was 90, like what yeah. did we think was going to happen? They were going to cure her of cancer and she was going to live 20 more years? Like, no, but we just did what the doctor told us to do. Right. Doctor. And so if But that's the doctor's like, job. The doctor is their their job is to prolong life mm -hmm. at any cost. Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. At any cost. And you know, I have some issue with that. And it's not their fault, right? Again, they're just doing what they're trained to do. Um, but it, we all have to get to a point where we have to realize that a human body is going to die. And eventually we have to get to the point where we say, we can't fix this. And doctors will sometimes even suggest treatments knowing that it's not going to benefit the person, but the family wants it so much. Like there's got to be something else we could try. And the doctors are like, all right, let's do this next thing, knowing that it's really not going to work. And so that's why it's a combination of everybody getting more comfortable with the fact that we will die no matter what. Eventually. Interestingly, interestingly, we wouldn't do that to our pets. Mm -mm. Right. We're like, you know what, we're going to, and I see it often, right? Oh, she, she was suffering. We're going to put her down. Right. Yeah. And, and there are stories of where pets were able to come around and make it and so on and so forth. And, um, as well. So in that conversation seems like typically, how do you address the person that's going to go into hospice? What, what, who do you, what would you call them? I'm like the person that goes in the hospice, I'm going to guess is typically ready to go into hospice. It's a family that pushes for them to keep fighting, to keep going, to keep doing, to keep, to mm -hmm. keep it up. Right. And to keep being willing to do the suffering for them to live. Yeah. Is that, well, do you find that to be true? And again, a lot of times, by the time somebody gets to hospice, 
they're so ready. They might not even be conscious anymore. You know, like with my grandmother's situation, she was still conscious, but she was ready. She was ready to die. And so the angels were calling. The, literally, the angels were calling for her. And so a lot of times the person that's going on hospice is very ready. And I think this is where my work as a end of life doula, as a death doula, as what I would consider even now as like an educator, you know, this is why I have my podcast. This is why I go out in my community and I do classes is because what I've learned is a lot of times too, when the family's holding on so tight, it's yeah. because of regrets it's because of shame. It's because they're not ready to let go of the person because they feel like there's unfinished business. They haven't said the things. They haven't done the things. This is why we need to do them now. Like actually I have on one of my t-shirts. It says, this is my one life and I'm living it fully because honestly, I have learned that I need to do things now. I need to say things now so that if God forbid, if my husband was to collapse and he was in the hospital, again, I'm still going to grieve. I'm still going to be sad. I'm still not going to be ready to let him go. Yeah. But I know that every single night, even last night, we watched um, Oppenheimer, the movie about like the nuclear bombs and stuff. And like, I was a little stressed out by it. And so I texted him after he went to bed and I was still awake. And I was like, just so you know, if anything were to ever happen, marrying you and having our children was the best decision I ever made in my entire life. And so I make that conscious decision to say to my children, to my mother, to my husband, every single day, I love you so much. Thank you for being in my life. Like I'm so grateful to have had you because if anything ever happened to them, I wouldn't have that feeling of like, I can't let go yet because I didn't say what I want to say. I can't let go because the last time I talked to them, I was mean to them or I was rude to them or I'm holding a grudge, even worse. People hold grudges forever and then somebody's dying and all of a sudden they're like, but no, 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 now I want more time. So if we yeah. could work through that stuff, if we could live our life differently, then we would be, I think, a little bit more willing to let go when it comes to the end, our own end, as well as people that we love, because we don't have those things that are keeping us feeling like they can't leave us yet. It's not time yet. So clear for, so maybe make it, it sounds like one of the things we could do is make a list of the people that we care about the most, that are closest to us, and just see, just kind of, is there, if they were to die, is there anything tomorrow? Is there anything that we wish are going to wish that we would have said, done, shared, um, yeah. and, and do it now and do it now. And also on that note, and though, let's bring, it, and let's say they live another, you, your relationship continues another 20, 30, you're, you're now starting from a free and clear space. Yes. What a, and I, I just see that like, what a great opportunity to increase that quality of relationship in the life that you have now. Yeah. That's, and that's a beautiful lesson. Even, you know, I've had people that I've talked to, one of the biggest things is really about forgiveness, not just forgiving the other people, but forgiving ourselves. Right? A lot of getting closure in relationships is forgiveness. And there's this misconception that forgiveness is essentially letting somebody get away with something like, well, they hurt me. And if I forgive them now, they get away with it. No, that's not really the reality of it. And, yeah. you know, for me, a good personal example is my father and I have never had a really good relationship. It's not bad. We've just, we were never close. He was never really well. Growing up, we did have a lot of resentment. resentment anger, anger. Just, I don't know. Just, I don't know. And so my biggest thing was I had to get to a place where when he dies, I'm going to be okay about it. And that doesn't mean that I reached out. It doesn't mean that I tried to have a better relationship, a closer relationship. It doesn't mean any of those things. It just means that I got to a place within myself where I was able to forgive him, where I was able to forgive myself and where I'm able to say now, if somebody were to call me and say, hey, your father died. And honestly, they might not even tell me right away. I might find out later because just again, the, the nature of our relationship. 
I'm okay with that. We'll be at peace. I'll be at peace about it because I have closure within me around this situation. And I have hard feelings. It's it's a really, it's a level of peace that if I see them today and I run into them at the store, I'm still going to say hi. I'll still talk to them. You know, I'm not angry. I'm not going to like avoid them. But also if you were to die tomorrow, okay. It'll be, you're not missing him because you don't have a relationship to miss. No, no. And I don't have that craving. I don't have that desire. I don't have those hard feelings that I was holding on to about that lack of relationship. I'm just kind of now like, okay, you know, we were two humans living this experience together a weird way, but it was still two humans living an experience together. Right. Okay. So it doesn't have to, that relationship. So, so somebody's made the decision to go into hospice. What are some things that you've seen that folks, they could have prepared better for the hospice experience, whether it was two days or 18 months? I think, again, the misconceptions of hospice, I thought this when, before I had the experience with hospice, I was like, oh, there's going to be somebody with me, like a lot, all the time. (laughs) That's not how it works. You're still needing a full-time caregiver. Um, Hospice comes in a couple hours, maybe a day. They might come in every other day. Um, You're going to have maybe a nurse. You'll have an aide that'll come in and kind of help with like the basics. You know, they would wash my grandmother's clothes for her. They would help me bathe her, which was a huge project getting, you know, somebody that's older and has lack of mobility into a shower is a lot harder than you think it is. Um, And so they did assist with a lot of things, but I was with her by myself a lot. And Mm. I didn't realize that that was going to be the case. And so unfortunately, they require a massive life change for the people in your life if somebody is going to go to this. Again, if they start early enough, maybe not as much. They might still be able to do a lot for themselves. But as it progresses, they're going to need more and more assistance, which means somebody is really going to have to be with them 24 hours a day. And that is really hard for a lot of us. It's hard for us, you know, because of money, right? People achieve our jobs. But also it's hard on us mentally and emotionally because we're not prepared for the reality. Again, like getting to having a baby. I know even for me, I knew that the baby was going to need a lot for me when they were first born, but you don't understand how much it's going to be until you're in it, right? It's very similar in a lot of ways where when you're caring for somebody full time, you know, again, sometimes middle of the nights with babies and people that are dying, that's when they're awake, they're agitated, they're moving around. My grandmother was like trying to leave and go places. You know, she thought she had somewhere to go, which again is something really common. People that are dying, that's how hospice can tell sometimes that something's their death because they'll talk about packing their bags, going on a trip. Like I need to get myself ready. I got to pack my bag. I got to get ready to go. And so she was was trying to go, trying to get up and leave in the middle of the night. That meant that I was awake in the middle of the night with her, talking to her, calming her down, making sure the doors were closed. Right. So what, okay. So now we've transitioned from, okay, we need to go into hospital. We've done a checklist. We've had the conversations. We've cleared our our emotional energy so that we can free them, so that we can feel free to free them to transition into you know that next. they um they've decided not to do um any saving life care, but just what is it palliative care? Right? Is that what they call it? Uh, yes, palliative care. So what do you think of it this way? Palliative care is a broader umbrella. Hospice is a version of palliative care. So if, say if you got diagnosed with a, you know, an illness, a life changing illness, you can still use palliative care. 
Palliative care is just there to help keep you more comfortable while you're doing all the different treatments. They have a lot of the same things that hospice will have. They'll have social workers, they'll have doctors, they'll have nurses that will allow you to still do your treatments, but kind of navigate it a little bit differently, talking more about long-term goals. When do I want to stop a life-saving treatment and maybe transition to hospice? Hospice is a very specific type of palliative care that is only for when you've stopped those life-saving treatments. Um, it's really, a lot of times they'll call it comfort care, right? It's just about keeping somebody comfortable versus curative, you know, life-sustaining treatments. But palliative care is amazing. Um, if people have not heard of it, if especially, again, if you have any type of like a life changing illness. It doesn't just have to be terminal illness, but like something that really affects your quality of life, you can probably still use palliative care. Um, so look into it for sure. Awesome. So we've got the checklist, palliative care. Now we're moving into hospice. We can care for ourselves to a certain extent, but then we transition to end of life mm -hmm. where how does that transition look? Because because the, all the, there's a lot of transitions. I feel like it's almost like a first trimester, second trimester, third trimester. Oh, I think we're getting contractions. Do we go to the hospital? Do we not go to the hospital? Do we wait at the hospital? Like where are we at on this, right? So I so now I feel like let's let's now transition to end of life. We can care for it. We're in hospice. We're not doing the life saving cancer treatment or whatever the treatment is. We're just making sure the quality of life that we have left is, is quality. But at some point, that quality of life declines tremendously. We're at end of life. How yeah. does that transition work? And what does that look like? And what are some things that we need to consider into that? Yeah. And again, it's going to be a little bit different for every person. Uh, but there are typically signs that we as end of life professionals know somebody is nearing the end of life. Um, breathing changes is one of the big ones. Uh, people sleep a lot more, even if they're not unconscious, but they'll still sleep a lot more. The body will typically stop eating and drinking. And that's a really hard one for people because think about it. You know, that's what we do when we love somebody. We feed our people that we love. And in so many people's households and so many cultures, food is such an important part of everyday life that when somebody stops eating, we want to sometimes try to force them to eat. But the body will stop wanting to eat. It'll stop wanting foods because it's trying to shut down. It, it knows what it needs to do. Just And this is why we're death doulas, similar to birth doulas, because there is a lot of similarities to birthing where the body knows what it needs to do. It might need a little assistance, but the body knows what it needs to do in order to birth. It also knows what it needs to do in order to die. And so some places do have like a hospice facility that you could maybe have somebody go to. A lot of times somebody will end up in a hospital just because people get anxious and upset. And so they call 911 and 911 comes and takes the person to the hospital. And so they live out their last couple hours or days in a hospital. But really, you know, it depends on the person. It can be done completely at home. I know sometimes that makes people a little, little uncomfortable. But to a lot of people, if you were ask them, they'd say, well, I don't want to die in my home. I want to yeah in my normal, comfortable surroundings with the things that I love, with the people that I love. And really, that is one of the things that having a death doula can really help is we are trained to make sure that people can get the experience that they want. We can help families find the hospices. We can, because you can interview hospices too. You know, yeah. I think again, with me, with my grandmother, the hospital was like, well, here's the hospital and this is the people and all this stuff. I didn't have to call anyone. We had a great experience, but some people don't. And they don't know that they can try different places, call different places. But again, when you're navigating yourself, you might even have the energy. Right. You for it. We can all of so I know for us, so I know for us, so like for when we did my, we had my, uh, my father went into the hospice wing 
right? Mm-hmm. And he passed away there. In hindsight, I wish we would have brought him home, not just for him, but for me, because I was up there 24 seven, my family would come and visit. And I think it would have been much better to have like comfortable for me. I'd have my food, I have my family, I'd have my family wouldn't have missed me so much. Because mm-hmm. you know, that process, it takes weeks for the body to shut down for him. Mm-hmm. And like, in hindsight, wish we would have gotten that bad home. Um, I think one of the things that he he ordered that I thought was so smart was he got a bed that um, like would, what was it? Like the bed like had air that would go like this so that. Oh yeah. To like move the body. To move the body so that he wouldn't, because he knew it was going to be a long process. So he wouldn't decompose like Mm -hmm. in the bed. Um, I thought that was really smart of him to have the foresight to think of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like a lot of little things. And I remember somebody was sharing that their mom didn't eat or drink, but she'd have a sip of wine. And that sip of wine just kept her alive forever, (laughs) forever and ever. Um, so if you were, what, uh, what other tips, what other mistakes or things like little tips do you think that people could real that would be helpful for folks as they're going through this and having somebody there is critical. Like I, we had somebody sitting with my dad and me pretty much 24 seven, um, in the last couple of weeks. And that was critical. Like just somebody who's like, am I making a good decision? Cause they'd ask me and I remember they're like, Hey, should we give them this? I'm like, what are you, why are you asking me? Like, I don't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Getting support is really important. Having people that you can talk to first off. Um, but a lot of it is, it's a very lonely time for somebody if you're caregiving. So just also having, you know, your friends trying to make sure that you say, Hey, you know, can you maybe check in on me once a day, just a quick phone call, just so that I have that connection. Um, getting people to help you again, as the caregiver, do some of the day-to-day stuff, you know, like, can somebody come over and take the trash out for me? Cause that's just a little bit more than I can handle right now. Right. Somebody maybe come over and fold some clothes. Like they don't have to help with the caregiving part of taking care of your loved one, but they can help with the day-to-day stuff. With life stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. With life stuff. And so many of us now are what they call the sandwich generation. We have kids that are yes. young. We have parents that are older and are potentially navigating this because a lot of us waited until we were older to have kids. And so I still have a 10 year old, 13 year old. My mother is in her seventies. Thankfully right now, you know, knock on wood, cause I am still a little superstitious. She's doing great. But if something were to happen and I had to care for her full time, Who's going to take my daughter to softball? Who's going to take my son to cross country? Who's going to do all of these things that I still have to do as a mother while also trying to care for my parent? And so that's where really, you know, I know for a lot of us, it's hard to ask for help because again, that's a cultural thing for a lot of us. But this is a time when people might say to you like, hey, I'm here if you need something, but they don't know what you might need. And that's one of the things that I do with um, some of my clients as well, is if you're a caregiver, let's get a list of people that might be willing to help, right? Your churches, your community, your friends, your children's parents, friends, right? I mean, like there's people around you that will, again, kind of be like, oh, if you ever need anything, let me know. And so let's get that list of people. And then let's get a list of things that you might need help with. Again, taking out the trash, running kids to softball, all the way up to like, I need to go to the pharmacy like three times a week for different medications and I just can't. And then you say to people, hey, I have this list of jobs. You know, like if there's anything that you feel comfortable maybe taking on for me, it would be really helpful. And then usually somebody will say, oh, you know, like I might not want to walk your dogs. I don't really like dogs but I don't mind running to the grocery store for you because right. I got to go that way anyway. And so, so, it's, so it's getting your support system 
in place for you personally, because you're going to be there in the caring. Um, You know, the other thing I discovered was when I reached out to family, they felt like they needed to come see my dad. Right. And I don't think he was really, that was something he wanted. And I think if I would have had that conversation ahead of time, I would have no, I would have probably been like, yeah, he's good. Mm -hmm. You know? Yes. Um, I wish there is a lot of that. There is, that is typical. Well, again, it goes back to those unfinished business, unsaid conversations. People feel like, oh, but I need to see them now. I need to see them. I need to say the thing. I need to have that closure. But the person that's dying, or even again, even for you, if you're taking care of somebody, you don't need people in and out of your house. You don't need to entertain as well, you know? Um, And a lot of people that are nearing death, they don't want people seeing them bed bound, potentially wearing adult diapers, not yeah. able to speak, you know, they don't want people seeing them that way. Yeah. Cause the body is completely drained of, I, it almost like of life, oh, even though it's, yeah. even though it's like technically alive, there's not life in it. Yes. It can be a very, um, it, again, it could be a very sacred experience. It could be a very beautiful experience. If you understand that this is the reality of somebody's life ending and having a stream of people coming through, not really a great time. And it's like having a stream of people while you're trying to, while you're giving birth. It's just, it's a little private. Exactly. (laughs) I don't, I don't, I don't need a lot going on while I'm trying to give birth. And I can, under I, that makes complete sense. If I, if you think of it that way, right. Stream of people coming in and out while you're working on passing away. What are three things that would make the process simpler or better for the person who's passing? Yeah, we can, especially if we have the conversations ahead of time, these are things that are important to talk about ahead of time, right? Find out what is important to them because We can set a room up in a way that makes it a little bit more comfortable for everybody. Some people like aromatherapy, some people like flowers, some people want music, some people don't want music. You know, like what is it that's important to the person as they're, especially like in the active dying phase, we might think that the person's unconscious, but they can still hear, they can still sense things. And so It's also like, again, have the conversation ahead of time, find out what's important to them, arrange for that. You know, if they want the flowers, if they want the things, whatever it is. But also just because somebody's unconscious doesn't mean that they can't hear you. So so I keep that to be sacred. When the family comes over and they want to start, I don't think this is right. Why are you doing this? Who's doing, keep all that in the other room. They don't need to hear that stuff. Right. Keep that inside in a different space because unfortunately, you know, it's a emotional time for people. So there's a chance that siblings might show up and disagree with what you've been doing this whole time. And they just moved in from California and all of a sudden they have all these things to say. Well, you know what, mom doesn't need to hear that. Mom doesn't need the drama. So keep that outside. Keep the space where they're dying a sacred, beautiful space for them as well as for you so that you can, you know, it's not going to last forever. Like that's the thing too is, yes, it is really difficult in the middle of it. But the more that we can prepare ourselves for saying, all right, you know, mom's going on to hospice. I'm going to need to take some time off of work. I'm going to need to pass some of my responsibilities off so I can be fully present for this experience. I, you know, read to your person. Like that's as my aunt was dying, she used to buy me books when I was a kid. So I got yeah, one of my favorite books that she bought me because she couldn't talk. She was awake, she was alert, but she couldn't communicate clearly. So what am I going to do? Just sit in the room and stare at her? You know, like that's comfortable. So I brought like four different books that she had bought for me when I was a child. I went to the library and I got copies of them. And I said, you know, which one do you want to read? I was like, this one was my favorite that you bought me. So she chose that one. And I read to her and I just sat there and I read out loud because it gave me something to do. It gave her the ability to hear my voice. 
to be with me, to experience my presence without either one of us feeling like we needed to do something to fill the space. But, you know, again, you need to sometimes have those conversations. You know, does somebody want a Bible or another religious text? Where do they want a child's book? Like, what is it they want? And really give yourself over to the experience and say, this isn't always going to be pretty. It's not always going to be pleasant, but I can make it a sacred, beautiful experience for somebody that I love to give them. Again, think about having babies. They puke on you. They poop on you. They keep you up all night. Like, it's not all beautiful. Babies are little, even as they grow up. I mean, it's not always beautiful. But the more that we can give ourselves over to all of it, the more that we can really appreciate the experience while we have it. And it's already been 13 years since my grandmother died. So that period of time for us was really a small period in my lifetime and with my time with her. And I'm glad that I was able to be there for her. It was a gift that I was able to give her. I just wish I was better prepared earlier on than I was, but I learned it as I went and that's okay too. So, so being prepared, how about the drugs that people, that people get? So they get like morphine, fentanyl, um, Dilaudid. Yeah. Yeah. So they would get in a lot of cases, um, a stronger pain medication than we would typically give somebody that's, you know, again, like as a 45 year old, I were to get hurt. Like, I don't want fentanyl. I don't want morphine. Like, I don't want to get addicted to it. I I don't don't want want to deal with it. I don't want any of that. Yeah. No, exactly. But as people near the end of life, again, a lot of times because of medical advancements, we live a lot longer with certain diseases than we would have. And so there can be a lot of pain that comes with the diseases, with the treatments, with all the And so they will give higher doses of pain medications than they would typically give to really just keep the person comfortable while also trying to keep them conscious, right? Where like they're not trying to like drug people into consciousness, but eventually they will, if they're dying naturally, they will lose consciousness. I mean, again, that's part of the- They should. Yeah, exactly. That's part of the process of a person dying. Um, and so they will give those things. They also will, in some cases, give anti-nausea medication because the person might be having nausea. Um, sometimes they'll even give like a little bit of Tylenol because what I learned that I didn't know before I became a death doula is the body temperature can really fluctuate. They can almost run a fever. And it's just, again, not to necessarily make the fever go away, not to cure anything, but it's just to bring the body temperature down to keep them more comfortable because running a high fever can be uncomfortable. So there is different medications that they might give at the end of life that are considered more comfort care to just help the person relax, help their body relax, and just keep them at a place where they're not in a deep state of pain and suffering. But again, it might be some people's religious beliefs are that we actually need that experience at the end of life, the pain, the suffering to kind of like burn off our karma, burn off our sins, whatever it is. So it might actually be against somebody's religion to have some of those medical oh, that, that breaks my heart a little bit, you know, like, because I, you know, I think about when we're dehydrated or if we get a cramp or we get something and that's when we know that's part of the dying is the body shutting down and how incredibly painful that is. Um, it can I would be. Let, I, I'm letting you know right now, if you're the person caring for me and you're my death doula, please give me all the drugs. I want the morphine, the Dilaudid, the fentanyl, the Tylenol, the just, I want all of it and I want a lot of it. So I have, I don't need that on, if anybody, I don't need to put that on my checklist. I feel like I've let you know, I've let the world know. Give me yeah. all the drugs, right? Um, I appreciate you sharing your checklist, your website, your resources, the group. How can we support you and your and your growth and your mission? Yeah, and thank you because that is one thing that, as of right now, um, death doulas as a whole, we're not making a lot of money. I mean, it's it's not a money making business. It's a very needed service within our communities. Um, but a lot of us are having a harder time making it into a business to support us. So 
you know, if you're local to any death doulas, if they're doing any classes in their communities, you know, take a class for them. It might be 20 bucks, but you know what? That's how a lot of us are actually making any money right now is teaching classes. Um, I did start again a t-shirt line because I found that one of the best ways to start conversations with people is when you're wearing a t-shirt and they're like, what does that mean? This is my one life and I'm living it fully. I'm like, I'm so glad you asked. So if you live somewhere, um, the t-shirts are all on my website. I have a variety of sizes and colors for each design. Nice. Get one of the t-shirts. Wear it I in your- I love the message. I love the message on that shirt. That is that is such an empowering um, message. Yeah, so. and that's the thing. Death conversations, again, they don't have to be scary and morbid and overwhelming. They can be fun. They could be a little bit lighthearted. They could be something where, you know, I wear this to a softball game and I guarantee somebody's going to start a conversation with me and say like, well, what does that mean? really interesting. And it just gets us having these conversations because the more that we can have the conversation with just like a, a quote unquote regular person, the more that then when it's time to have it with somebody that we're really close with, that we really love, it'll be easier. It'll be more comfortable. So if you're interested, we call it like death positive, right? So if you're interested in like a death positive shirt that you can wear out in your community, it'll help me as a small business owner, um, but also it'll start really good conversations. I love that. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Oh, um, thank you for having me. I appreciate you giving me the space to talk about this. Well, it's a subject that is dear to my heart. Um, it's interesting because in my, this isn't actually like this podcast, I was talking to a friend, I said, Hey, did you listen to the, I had this conversation about, um, a friend of mine who I know her niche is, um, releasing generational trauma. Ooh, and that's so, a good one. and she said, she's like, Oh, that has nothing to do with real estate. I said, no, this podcast actually has very little to do with real estate, but at the same time. It all like it is so much of what we do and what we love. And um, I appreciate you for coming on here and sharing with us.